In this video, we're showing a do-it-yourself ferro cell and how some magnets interact with it to show magnetic field lines, or something like it. Many of you will know that my particular area of interest is magnetism and that this is what my research focuses on. Prior to Colon sending me a link to Ken Wheeler's channel, I had actually no idea that there's a whole community of woo peddlers on the internet who also take an interest in the subject. The Magnetism Woo community spans a wide range of characters. At the bottom of the pile are people like Ken Wheeler, who is an obvious charlatan and a grifter. Then at the top of the pile is a channel known as Fractal Woman, which is run by Laurie Gardy, who is clearly a shut-eye. Now she has latched on to some demonstrably incorrect ideas, but she actually tests things, and as a result she has a far more sensible framework. Now, I think her material is born out of a fundamental misunderstanding of the theory, and it certainly looks as if her honesty and curiosity will save her and eventually lead her to developing a decent understanding of the subject. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Scientific Lee, with whom I had a brief exchange in one of his comments sections. That exchange encouraged me to make a video to address some of the points he made. That video did not come to fruition, as it was long, and I decided to break it down into smaller pieces, and this is the first one. And there is something that most of the Magnetic Woo channels have in common though, and that is their use of the Ferrocell. Now, the Ferrocell is a simple device developed by a chap called Tim Vanderelli. It is just two pieces of glass with a small cavity between the pieces. The cavity is filled with ferrofluid, which is just nanometer sized iron filing suspended in a fluid. Around the circumference of the construction you'll find a series of LED lights. When you place a magnet on the ferrocell and turn the LEDs on, you get cool patterns. And there's nothing that the Woo community loves more than pretty patterns and geometries as if they have magic properties. Tim Vanderelli and many other people in the magnetic Woo community will tell you that these patterns show magnetic field lines. However, as you go through the images of these things in actions, you will quickly find that this claim is rather problematic. So problematic in fact that even though Tim claims it on his website that the device shows magnetic fields, he explicitly states something different in the literature that he's trying to get published, like this paper, which actually for the life of me, I can't see how it got published. A nice and easy way to visualize magnetic fields is by pouring some iron filings on a piece of paper and bringing a magnet near the iron filings. But many proponents of the ferrocell will claim that this is actually not really the magnetic field and you should be looking at the patterns that the ferrocell shows because that really is the magnetic field. But there we run into a problem. A magnetic field is actually defined in terms of these iron filings. The ferrocell may show something really profound, now spoiler alert, it doesn't, but whatever it shows, it is not a magnetic field. A field is defined in terms of the force that a particle would experience if it were at some position in that field. For example, the gravitational field is given by this expression. And this expression states that at some given position in space, a particle will accelerate towards the center of mass. The relationship between the field and the force is the product of the field and the amount of the property that the field acts on. In the case of the gravitational field, this property is mass. So to get the force, we multiply the field by the mass. Using dimensional analysis, this becomes more obvious. The gravitational field has dimensions of distance per time squared, or acceleration, but we can also see this as a force per unit mass. As the gravitational force is the product of the gravitational field and the mass in the field, we can take those dimensions and multiply them by mass to get force. And the same goes for the electric field, for example, which is given by this expression, which has dimensions of force per unit charge. That is to say, force divided by the property that the field acts upon. Place a charge in that electric field and we multiply these dimensions by charge and we get force. The property that the magnetic field affects is magnetic moment, or charges that are moving at some given velocity. Either one of the two is fine. We can define the magnetic field in terms of that force using the Lorentz force law. And from dimensional analysis, we find that the magnetic field has dimensions of mass per time squared per current. 
A different but compatible definition of the magnetic field is in terms of a dipole moment. Now, a dipole moment is just something that has two opposite quote-unquote charges separated by some distance. A dipole moment is a vector quantity that points from the negative charge to the positive charge as per convention. The magnitude of the vector is dependent on the magnitude of the charges and the distance between the two. Although strictly speaking, you cannot have isolated charges and magnetism and therefore you can't have two monopoles spaced some distance apart, we can still treat stuff as magnetic dipoles and a magnetic dipole moment is often denoted with a lowercase mu. Another way to define a magnetic dipole moment is in terms of a current loop where you have a ring in which a current flows. The dipole moment is defined as the magnitude of the current multiplied by the surface area enclosed by the loop. Note that the surface area here is a vector quantity which is normal to the surface enclosed by the loop. Now we can define the magnetic field in terms of the torque or the rotational equivalent of force acting on a moment in a magnetic field. The potential energy of a magnetic moment in a field is then given by the negative of the scalar product of the magnetic moment and the magnetic field. Now, if you are not familiar with the scalar product, for the purposes of this video, all you need to know is that the dot product of two vectors is the same as multiplying the magnitude of each vector and the cosine of the angle between the two. And when we plot this out as a function of the angle between the two, we find that the lowest energy state for a magnetic moment is to align with the magnetic field. Now, what has this got to do with iron filings? Well, iron filings are thin rods of iron, and small and thin rods of magnetic material like to be magnetized such that the poles are on the thin ends. Each atom in a magnet is a tiny magnetic moment, and they all like to be aligned. Each atom has a north pole and a south pole. So in the bulk of the magnet, the north pole on each atom is right next to the south pole of the next atom. And they are cancelled out until you get to the ends of the magnets where the atoms at the surface don't have another atom to cancel their pole out. So you end up with lots of north poles on one surface and lots of south poles on the other surface. And these all add up to give to us what appears as one big North Pole and one big South Pole. But we can see a pole as a charge. The North Pole is the positive or negative charge. I can never remember the two. And the South Pole is a negative or whatever, the opposite charge. So we have two charges separated by some distance and therefore a magnetic moment. And magnetic moments align with the magnetic field as per the definition of a magnetic field. So iron filings on a piece of paper is the correct way of visualizing a magnetic field because whatever it is that makes iron filings arrange themselves in that way, whatever that is, that is what we define as the magnetic field. Next comes the idea of a field line. Now, a field line is defined as a line where at any point on that line, the direction of the magnetic field is tangent to it. This means that iron filings align themselves so their long axis is tangent to the field or the field line. So we are now in a position to show that Despite what Tim van der Rellie's website states, a ferrous cell does not show magnetic fields or magnetic field lines. We can take this picture of a ferrous cell, which according to the caption has three cube magnets on it. Now, this is useful because there are limited configurations in which these magnets can sit. And this can be that there's a pole on the top of the central magnet and the opposite poles on the top of the other two magnets, which would generate a field which looks like this. Or the same configuration, but the whole thing is rotated so the poles are facing towards you out of the screen, which would generate a field that looks like this. Now, intuition may tell you that the magnetic field should be out of plane in this situation, but you just have to remember that the magnets are raised slightly above the ferrofluid, so we get a slightly different picture. But finally, we have the situation where the magnets are all aligned and the poles are on the left and the right of each magnet and that would produce a field like this. And we see that none of the instances match what the ferrous cell shows. And this is our first big clue that the ferrous cell does not show magnetic fields. Our next clue comes from considering the definition of a field line. 
Remember that a field line is defined as a line where the direction of the magnetic field is always tangent to the line. And then we take this image, and here we see lines crossing, and this is a problem. Because if these were field lines, then the direction of the magnetic field would have to be tangent to both lines at the point where they cross at the same time. And that's not possible. Now, I mentioned Fractal Woman earlier in the video. She has a more sensible idea about what the ferrous cells show. Her claim is that the ferrous cell shows isopotential lines, and this would be interesting, and from certain examples she gives, it can look that way. The first clue is that isopotential lines, which are lines which indicate all points where the potential is the same, are always orthogonal to the magnetic field. Now, the magnetic scalar potential is defined in terms of the magnetic field such that the magnetic field is the negative of the gradient of the scalar potential. So a line connecting all points with equal potential energy would definitely be orthogonal to the magnetic field. But just like a field is the force per amount of the property that the field affects at a given point in the field, a potential is the amount of energy per amount of that property at a given point. And we see from this image that this notion must also be incorrect, because this implies one of two things. First is that there are two values for the potential where these lines cross, and this means that the magnetic moment and that position would have two separate values for potential energy. That would be like saying that you are simultaneously on the ground floor of a building and on the roof, or a cup of coffee would be warm and cold at the same time. So that is an unphysical explanation for what we observe. Of course, we could say that the potential is the same at the points where they cross, and that would imply that all the lines have the same potential. And that is every point on the line has the same value. And that would indicate that the potential is constant. And from our expression, we find that if psi is a constant, then it is not a function of space, and the del operator would return zero, which means that there is no magnetic field. So whatever the ferrous cell shows, it is not consistent with our definition of magnetic fields, magnetic field lines, or the magnetic potential. It may show something interesting, but whatever it shows, it's not any of those. And that does leave the question, as to what the ferrous cell really shows. Well, by the looks of it, it is just specular reflections. We can look at this micrograph of a few particles inside the ferrous cell, and we see that they are indeed thin rods, and we know that the long axis of these rods will align with the magnetic field. Now, specular reflections are these straightforward reflections that you get from a mirror. If the angle between you and the mirror's normal vector is equal to the angle between the object and the mirror's normal vector, you will see the object in the mirror. Considering that, this diagram is what would describe what happens inside the ferrous cell. And we can model this using ray tracing. And here's an image that I made using a few thousand thin metal rods randomly positioned with their long axes determined by the smallest potential energy in a magnetic field. I place 12 LEDs in a circle around the rods and the LEDs alternate between cyan, magenta, and yellow. The fun thing is that this is pure ray tracing. It doesn't really do much more than calculate the path of the light whilst accounting for basic optical effects like reflection and refraction. But you can see that this reproduces the ferrous cell-like pattern. And from this, we can surmise that the lines we see on the ferrous cells are just the LEDs reflecting off the nanorods. Oh, and that paper by Tim I mentioned earlier, this is what he says happens in the ferrous cell. In fact, this diagram comes from one of his papers. But on his website, he still claims that it is a magnetic field viewer. But in that paper, he also implies that the ferrous cell shows isopotential lines with this image, where he claims that the left panel show a simulation of the right panel. Now, the two really do not match. Seriously, I'm astonished that this got published. It's not even as if the publisher is predatory or anything. MDPI is a very well-respected publishing group, and this goes to show that the stuff does fall through the cracks during peer review. So in this video, we have established that the ferrous cell does not show magnetic fields. This comes from what we define the magnetic field to be. The ferrous cell does not show magnetic field lines because magnetic field lines cannot cross. And for the same reason, the ferrous cell also doesn't show isopotential lines. 
What seems to be the case is that the fire cell just shows specular reflections of the LEDs. And that leads to the question, does the fire cell actually have scientific value? Well, I suppose that if you know the viewing angle and the position of the LEDs, then you can use that information to figure out the actual magnetic field, but that would require a lot of tedious computation. Instead, you can just take a whole probe. Now, is the ferrous cell interesting? Yeah, it shows some cool stuff and definitely is a cool toy, but it's not much more than a cool toy. So with that, thank you all for popping along. Uh, there will be another video in this vein and we will be looking at block walls and what they are and how the magnetism woo community doesn't understand them. But a special thanks to my patrons who know who they are and how absolutely spectacularly brilliant they are. And thank you all for watching and until next time. <laughs>